The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What have we heard what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here also in your own country. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when there came a great famine over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and put him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built, and they might throw him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath day, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Years ago, an old friend of mine had his sermon printed in the Dallas Morning News. A reporter or a columnist for the paper was in the congregation and thought it was just needed to be heard and made it happen. And before you start asking, it wasn't anything about St. Matthias, anybody over there. If memory serves, he had addressed an issue that was kind of a hot topic in the current events of the day. And she noted how the congregation responded when he was finished with thunderous, applause, which actually made me a bit skeptical about the message itself. Applause may seem like a good sign, of course, but it may not be for a sermon. And it seems like this applause on this occasion was perhaps driven more by politics than by the gospel. Among preachers, there's kind of a saying that you really haven't preached a great sermon until you've gotten some angry letters or death threats, or they tried to run you out of town. When you preach the gospel, your loyalty is first to the Lord and to his message alone. When you stand in the pulpit, you shouldn't be afraid of being run out of town as a consequence. And of course, more than one prophet in the Bible was explicitly called to deliver a message that God's people did not want to hear, and they were told that in advance. Now, I've never gotten any death threats myself, maybe some uncomfortable looks or questions, And part of me hopes that I never really preach the sermon that rises to that level of greatness. But that is the kind of reaction that Jesus ended up with after giving his message in the synagogue in Nazareth when he preached on the scroll that he read from Isaiah. We heard the first part of the story last week. In his hometown synagogue, Jesus took that Isaiah scroll and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when he sits down, it's not because he is finished, but because this is the traditional posture of the teaching rabbi. And so all eyes are fixed on Jesus, waiting for what he might have to say about the text when what he says is, today this scripture was fulfilled as I read it out to you. Last Sunday we talked about how Jesus is the incarnate word. The God-man is God's message. He is the good news in the flesh. And he is still the center of God's kingdom coming among us today as he was that day in the synagogue. Jesus' public ministry began with the proclamation of the kingdom of God 
The text that he read was an Old Testament prophecy of the coming Messiah. And Jesus tells them explicitly, the Messiah has come. He's here. He's me. The Messianic age you just heard about is dawning right here in the midst of you. When it's our turn to testify to the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, we must never waver in that. We must never equivocate, never say something like, well, he's an expression of the divine for us. Or Jesus is how we encounter God, as if there were alternatives. Tell them the truth and tell them directly. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. He's God come down from heaven, the savior of the world, the second person of the Trinity, the judge of the living and the dead. Jesus never equivocated about his calling and his identity. He spoke directly and he spoke from the heart, heart to heart. And he spoke with power and authority. He spoke with clarity and conviction. And of course, there's two ways to respond to that. And in fact, that's what we find, that some fell to their feet in repentance and hailed him as Lord in his ministry. Others tried to run him out of town or pick up rocks to stone him or even plotted with the Romans to get him crucified. Jesus was clear and direct in the synagogue on that day. I am the long-awaited Messiah. I'm sure there was a period of stunned silence. And then the whispers began. What did he say? Did you hear him? Did I hear him right? Isn't that Joe's boy? The mood was amazement, but not without some growing hostility. He appears to be saying some extraordinary things, but they are naturally skeptical about the truthfulness. Perhaps there's a turning point in their reaction. It seems to be so. When they come around to saying, who does this guy think he is? Where has he gotten such wisdom, supposed wisdom? Isn't he just one of us? A guy who grew up down the street? What makes this rabbi so distinguished? Messiah, that means anointed by God. The scripture has been fulfilled right here and now? Jesus couldn't help but overhear their whispered reactions. I'm sure you're about to quote me the old proverb, physician, heal yourself. Why don't you show us some of those messianic powers that others might have seen? Very truly, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Jesus began to articulate what they were saying, their own rejection of him. So he was calling them out. A variant reading of this verse makes the meaning a little more direct. No prophet is acceptable in his own country, and no physician works his cures on those who know him. Something about familiarity sometimes gets in the way of what God is doing. And now we begin to really see the cause of their rage. Jesus just announced the coming of God's kingdom and his Messiah, and they are keenly aware they don't fit into his description. So his sermon might as well have been, God's real people are other people. They don't look like you. Nothing like you, in fact. The poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. Okay, you might say, well, what about me? We know this is the message that they're getting because of what Jesus says next. He tells them, look, it's not surprising for God to go to other people, the people we least expect. And Jesus gave them two examples. He reminded them, once there was a drought in Israel, and during the time of scarcity of food, during that time, God only sent his prophet Elijah to a Shulamite woman to work a miracle for a non-Jew living outside the Holy Land. And again, his successor Elisha ignored all the Israelites with leprosy and was sent only instead to heal Naaman the Syrian. But the real kicker is how Jesus seems to indicate that God would be more than happy to work such miracles and wonders among them right there and then. But the problem was their own pride had made that impossible. In fact, in Mark's version of the story, this is followed up with a note that Jesus didn't do any miracles there. He moved on for that very reason. They simply were not receptive. Well, this was too much. When they heard it, 
everyone was filled with rage in the synagogue. The synagogue became a mob, and they drove him out of the town, and they led him to the brow of the hill to throw him off a cliff. But Jesus slipped through the crowd and got away that day. It wouldn't be the only time he would slip through the fingers of an angry mob. But ultimately, when the time was right in God's plan, Jesus submitted himself to their demands for his life. And in doing so, he did work wonders among those who were not ready to receive him. The greatest wonder of all that we commemorate at every Mass, our salvation worked out at the cross. And there he showed his messianic identity to those who once were spiritually blind. He was healing the brokenhearted and releasing those held captive by the chains of sin, liberating the oppressed and ushering in the kingdom of God and the favor of the Lord. What ought to get us a little upset is that perhaps the saints of God don't look a whole lot like you and me either. But we should be upset at the right things for the right reasons. We should be upset with ourselves for our faults, not for ever being called out for them. Perhaps our own pride, our own preoccupation with ourselves, our needs, our wants, our desires, has blinded us to God's wonders among us from time to time, among those who might be right next to us, but not us. It has enabled us not to recognize and appreciate sometimes the good work that God is doing right now among those who are not, and fill in the blank, you know, Americans, middle class, Anglicans, Christians, whatever. But the greater danger is that our spiritual blinders may not only keep us from recognizing God's goodness elsewhere, it may keep us from being a part of it, right here, right now, wherever we are. This was the case for all but one of the twelve when it came to Jesus' final hour. All but one were unwilling to heed the message of suffering, which they simply did not agree with and want to be a part of. All but one scattered, ran away, and even betrayed Jesus. Each one of us today is very lucky in that regard. The involvement of those disciples was not necessary for God to work the mighty wonder at the salvation obtained at the cross, where Jesus atoned for the sins of the world and released us all from the captivity of sin and death. So let us pray for the grace of humiliation, of humility, that the next time the Lord reveals himself, begins to do a mighty work and wonder, we won't be like the townspeople who refused to hear Jesus and refused to be a part of what he was doing, but that we would be a lot more like those in the next towns that we begin to hear of, towns like Capernaum, where he went next, who heard him speak with authority and were filled with faith and saw Jesus work kingdom wonders in their very midst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.